If you've got your Bible tonight or your tablet, I want you to open it again. I want to thank Elder Michael for taking us to the Gospel of John. There I will lift a thought as well tonight from that passage. I'll begin to read again, beginning with verse 9. And I want to draw your attention, of course, to verse 12. Um, but let's look and let's listen as I read the context for the message, beginning with verse 9. If you have it, say amen. amen. As the Father As the Father loved me, John 15, 9. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love have no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. And the church said, amen. amen. Look at that verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. This afternoon, I want to speak to you, all of you here, from the subject, be a friend like Jesus. Be a friend like Jesus. There's a book in my study, Pastor Gaines, one that I have enjoyed entitled Love as a Way of Life. I'm pretty sure you might have seen it. Some of you might have a copy. It's a good book written by Gary Chapman. Some of you might know him as the marriage guru. He is no doubt one of the great marriage counselors and marriage enrichment guys, uh, one of the most gifted that I have heard to the body of Christ. So I was drawn to his book, Love as a Way of Life. In the book, there are many stories about people from across the country who have discovered the joys of living out what Gary calls the characteristics of a loving person. And he names those characteristics kindness, honesty, patience, courtesy, humility, forgiveness, and of course, generosity. The book is well written. It's inspirational to me. I've added it to my collection of maybe about 2,800 books. But, you know, I took issue with Gary, and you forgive me. Don't put this on the Internet. I took issue with Gary because the secret to being a loving person is not these characteristics that I just mentioned. It's knowing Jesus. The secret is knowing Jesus. And not just anybody named Jesus, but the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible, the one John tells us that in the beginning was the Word. And that the Word was with God and was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, that as of the only begotten of the Father. So when I looked at these seven characteristics, I didn't, I didn't agree that that's what's going to make you a loving person. What's going to make you a loving person is knowing the living Lord Jesus Christ. And I found seven declarations of his deity in the Gospel of John, beginning with him being the Word. And then some of you might remember he told the woman at the well that he was also the living water. And if I could say anything to you tonight, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, we have the one who will quench all of our thirst. I have found Jesus to be a great thirst quencher. 
He has satisfied all of my longings for meaning and value and beauty. And so I want you to know that though Gary's got a good book, you might enjoy it. It won't hurt you as a Christian, but you ain't going to do nothing about loving in the sense that will honor God without Jesus. And it's Jesus who is not just the living water, but John tells us he is also the bread of life. He is that which satisfies as well as sanctifies. John wants us to know seven things about this wonderful one who makes loving people out of hateful people. And I don't know about you, I'm still happy that the Lord is still working on me. How about you? See, there's some rough edges even in the Christian. There's some roughness that needs to be smoothed out. There's some bumps and some cracks that only the spirit of the living God can fix. You're not going to get that from a book. You need it from a person. And see now, don't, don't take this the wrong way. I'm home tonight. Don't take this wrong. But see, you, if you're going to, you, you need more than a master class. I don't want to get on Oprah now. But you need the master of the class. You need more than, than, than just fix my life. You need Jesus to fix the life. You can't talk forgiveness without the blood of the Lamb. And I'm just sad that our people are falling for substitutes when they could have the living water and the bread of life. And then John tells us he ain't just the living water and the bread of life. He is the light of the world. And if you want to come out of darkness, you're going to have to call on the light of the world. But I've come to remind my family here tonight, you don't have to stay the way God finds you. One of the things I love so much about being a Christian is that I don't have to stay the way I am. That is so attractive to me because you know and I know without the light, we walk in the dark. I wonder, do I have a witness? But Jesus is the light of the world. And what I like is, once that light shines on the inside, even the darkness ain't the same no more. Once that light shines, you ain't going to be happy in the darkness no more. Something about the light of Christ. The Bible says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness is unable to put it out. And I've come to remind you that you don't have to stay the way you are. You can walk in the light. And the light of the world is Jesus. John tells us seven things about Jesus. He is the light of the world. And then the text tells us in chapter 10, he is also the good shepherd. Because we need somebody to guide and direct us. It's one thing to be a Christian, but he will order your steps as the good shepherd. We are on our way to the Father's house, but we are not home yet. But that's all right. The good shepherd knows the way to the Father's house. And I want you to know that the good shepherd will lead and guide you. And you ain't got to worry about being off track or on the wrong road. If you follow the good shepherd, he will lead you to the Father's house. You don't get lost following Jesus. Oh, you might take a detour, but you're getting back on the road. Because when you get off the road, the good shepherd, unlike others, will come and get you. But when you got a hired hand, that hired hand, he ain't coming after you. See, that's the difference in a hired hand and an under shepherd like your pastor. Because he ain't going to let you keep on walking in the dark. If he hears about it, he going to call you in. And that's why we don't have some of the people that started with us because they don't want an under-shepherd that's going to give them some discipline when they need it. But you ain't no child of God. If God don't correct you, you don't belong to Jesus. I wonder if I have a witness. Oh, I'm not what I want to be, but I ain't never going to be what I was. And I wonder about people that ain't got no change. 
I don't know that they done met the Jesus of the Bible. Because there ain't nobody met Jesus and stayed the same. I wonder, do I have a witness? Y'all help me and we can get out of here. The light of the world is Jesus. The good shepherd is the Lord Jesus. And then John says he is the door to heaven. He is the way to get us in. And there is no entrance into the Father's house but by me, Jesus said. No man comes to the Father. And now with all our reality television shows, we want to act like there's another way to the Father's house. But I've come to tell you there's no master class without the master. I don't care who's on the show. Don't get mad with me. I ain't mad with nobody. I listen. I can hear. But when I don't hear Jesus, I got a reason to turn you off. I like Steve Harvey, but if you ain't talking Jesus, you better stick to your jokes. And I know sister want to fix your life and fix my life. And she gets you all stirred up, but she ain't going to wash away that sin. Not, nothing can wash away my sin but the blood of Jesus. You might go home and be friends for a couple days. You're going to be you're going to need to be washed in the blood of the lamb. Faith in the merits of the blood is what cleanses sin. And you ain't going to get that shame and guilt telling it to a camera. But if you get in a closet and close the door somewhere and call on the one name under heaven so you ain't got to tell nobody what happened but Jesus. And if you tell Jesus what happened, let me tell you, you can be cleansed and forgiven. I'm not mad with the television people. I'm not upset with nobody. I tried, I tried my best not to be angry. But then it hit me. Greenleaf ain't about the true church. I mean, come on now, don't get, don't get mad with me. You want to know what the corrupt church is? If anybody on there saved, it ain't because of the show. It would have to be in spite of the show because that's not a picture of the true body of Christ. Because the true body of Christ ain't in this for the money. Because I had money when I came to Christ. But I was lost. I had a good job. I didn't come to Christ to get a job, to get a promotion, to be successful. I didn't come to Christ to find a beautiful woman. I had a beautiful woman. I came because I was a sinner who needed salvation. None of that money I had in my pocket satisfied my hunger. And as beautiful as that girl is that I married, the minute I came to Christ, I would have never been satisfied without Jesus. And I wouldn't have been no husband to her. None she would want to own were it not for the Christ of this Bible. And them boys that I fathered, they wouldn't own me as their father if they had to come before Jesus got a hold of me. But I know him to be a life changer. I know him to be a mind regulator. I know him to be the real and the answer to all our questions. And I'm happy that he would call me from the darkness. And I don't glory in none of the sin and shame that I partook of before Jesus shined the light. John says he is the door and the good shepherd, the light, the living water, the bread of life. John says he is also 
as the brother sang about the resurrection. You know, if Jesus, we don't have time tonight, but if, if Jesus, if he didn't do something about death before getting up himself, we might have some questions about that. Uh, but long before going to the cross, Jesus would go to the graveyard. And not just once, but more than once, Jesus would go so that you and I might know that he had the power of life and death. It's in his hands. He's got the keys. Say amen. amen. And as a Christian, you don't go home until Jesus comes down and put the key in the door. You don't go till the key is put in the door by the one who holds the key. Because he comes to get his own. Say amen. amen. John tells us that Jesus then reveals himself as the true vine. The one to supply strength to the branches, sustenance and uh, strength and resource. That he is the source and the resource the true vine and he says that as the true vine that the secret to being a friend like Jesus it's found in the text my brothers and sisters he says love as I have loved you now that's where I want to take you tonight for here in our context Jesus he gives us the standard by which all real love can be measured you want to understand what real love is. As the woman said, what's love got to do with it? Well, you need to ask Jesus that question. Because you will get the right answer from Jesus. I don't know about the rest of these people. The standard is here and the Lord Jesus is not commanding you and I to do something that he himself was not an example of. You see, he displayed his love more than one, on one occasion, more than a few times, he showed himself to be an example that we could follow. Jesus was truly a friend in need and a friend indeed. And if you want a perfect example, sometimes you can't look at other people. I'm sorry, but sometimes you know and I know, I remember when I first got married, my mother told Sister Greer, she said, you better get a color TV fast. She said, you're going to get tired of looking at him. Because I just stared at her for hours, and she'd look at me, and I, I was handsome too then. Well, at least, I, at least she thought I was. And that's all that matters. And we, we didn't have a color TV at the time. Black and white was a better price. And I'll never forget mother saying, y'all got a color TV yet? I said, no, not yet. We still using the paper over top of the TV. <laughs> mother said, you better get a color TV fast. She gonna get tired of looking at you. <laughs> and I didn't understand, but mother, mother knew what she was talking about. Now we got them all over the house. <laughs> we got one in every room. <laughs> y'all don't like me. Let's tell it like it is. I remember the couple married for almost 50 years and everybody wanted to know the secret. So the husband, he said, that's easy. I'm blind and she deaf. I can't see and she can't hear me. We getting along fine. And I said, no, that's not the answer I'm looking for. But the answer is in the word of God. It's in the God of the word. And I don't want you to accept substitutes. Don't accept something less when you can have God's best. And Jesus is the best of heaven. And this is just a display of his love. He would send his best. That which all of heaven worship and adore took a humanity for the purpose of redemption. God was in Christ. Don't settle for substitutes. Don't settle for psychiatrists and psychologists when you can have Jesus. He was a friend 
And some might question it, but not many Christians would doubt Jesus was truly a real friend in need. Uh, look at the woman caught in adultery. What a master Jesus was to show those who condemned her themselves and then to show her a way to start over. Oh, see, this is what you'll love about Jesus. The more you know about him, the more you'll love him. But you can't recommend something that you don't know yourself. Spend your time getting to know more about Jesus. It's been great, a great honor of mine for many years now just to be a Christologist and just to search and to study the words and the works of Jesus. And there you discover God himself wrapped in humanity for the purpose of redemption. You want to know what love is? Look at Jesus. Not what people say about him. Look at what he says about himself. I have loved you as the Father have loved me. And you know the Father loved him. You know he was loved by his Father. And he says that same agape love is the love that I have for you. The love that was bestowed upon me by my Father. And I want you to know when you and I get a hold of this, we will, as Gary says, begin to love as a way of life. And that's the goal that God has in mind for you and me. The gold standard is Jesus. Nothing and no one is greater than he is. In fact, the Bible says that in all things it pleases the Father that Jesus should have the preeminence. So all these people talking about the Holy Ghost. Listen, Jesus said when he comes, I'm going to send him. But when he arrives, he's not going to talk about himself. He's going to talk about me. And I'm going to give the glory to my father. And if you ask anything in my name, oh, Lord, help us. Oh, I wonder, I wonder sometimes what happens when people let false teachers take them from the ground that is sacred. Jesus is all you need. And the world will tell you otherwise. But I want you to know this afternoon, if you want to talk about a friend, Let's talk about Jesus. Some of you might remember that Peter, he's not as inspirational to us as Paul is because he was a little bit quick to say things that weren't right. Some of us share that same flaw. Say amen. That's another thing I learned when I took a wife you don't have to say everything you're thinking. She only listening to half of it anyway. Okay? <laughs> Somebody told me, but I didn't hear. I was kind of hard at hearing. Let your words be few. Say what you mean. Mean what you say. Don't do a whole lot of talking. It's taken me 37 years, and I'm still learning to be more willing to hear than to speak. Jesus knew how to listen to people. Remember Peter told him, you ain't going to the cross. God's got another plan. And I'm ready to die for you right now. And let him come. I got a sword. How many of y'all know he took it out and used it? But the Lord said, listen, Peter, I've prayed for you. And before the cock crows three times, you're going to deny me, but when you repent and are turned again, I'm going to use you to strengthen others. Isn't God a mighty God? Nobody here would deny Jesus was truly a friend, a friend who stuck closer than brothers. And you might want to know what does it mean
to be a friend like Jesus. Well, the context tells us that the love Jesus displayed was a true love. You know, that's the thing that bothers me. Some come to the altar, and some don't even come to the altar no more. They just promise some woman, I'll marry you when I get ready and get the strength and get the money and get the job. And, and it's what a shame. What a shame when you can get married. It used to be for $35. I guess it's 60 now at the courthouse. I know that's pretty high for some. But you say you love the woman. The love Jesus had was a true love. It wouldn't promise something and then not deliver. It was a true love. It, was, it wouldn't promise something and then disappoint later. Jesus never would take advantage of somebody and exploit them. You don't find him ever, you don't find him ever taking uh, 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 the upper hand on somebody and using it to their advantage. Jesus had a true love. And it was a tough love. Say amen. It was a tough love. Some of us don't like tough love, but Jesus loved you just the way you are, but too much to leave you where he finds you. That's because the love he has is a transforming love. And I love that. Jesus takes deformity and transforms it into something beautiful. And I remember hearing when asked by some art lover why and how Michelangelo could take a big slate of stone and then all of a sudden make a David out of it. People wanted to know how, did, how does he do that? And he told them that's easy. I just knock off all of the pieces that don't contribute to the image I wanted to have. This is what Jesus will do to you and me. Oh, yes, he'll take it away. He will knock it off. Some of us need to let go the sin and the weight that does easily beset us. You don't know it, but at the, at the minute you let it go, there will be the power to live a different life. Oh, it took me some time, brothers and sisters, before I discovered that if I would step out in obedience, there only would be the power to live a life I could never live without him. And there are some of God's children that are still halting between two opinions. But I tell you, if you let go, just let it go and let God take over and then you will be a witness to his power and to his glory. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Yes, you know we were created in the image of God. And we were created to love, but it was marred by the fall of Adam. But Jesus comes to restore us to the Father's love and to fellowship with him. He comes to regenerate us, to redeem us. And I'm happy about that tonight. And yes, to be a friend like Jesus, notice now the text says that this is my command. So let's examine this love before we go home tonight. One, it was a love. I said it was true. It was tough. It was transforming. But let's look at it. What it does, it takes the initiative. That's one. And then it acts sacrificially. Say amen. Amen. And then it hopes, and it has as its hope this desire to make us related to him. And so this is something I feel that could be of some help tonight. And now listen, I stand corrected by your pastor. This is the place where he stands. But Pastor Gaines, I must say that perhaps that the reason there is so much division and strife in the church now, perhaps it is because these three things are missing. And that is, one, we don't want to take the initiative to love. Then we, some of us certainly don't want to act sacrificially. And we're not hoping, perhaps, even to make others members of his family. 
Could it be, Pastor, could it be that disobedience to this one command? Look at verse 12 again. This is my commandment, that you love one another. That's not as hard as I have loved you. See, because God have loved you. Even when you wasn't doing right, God loved you. Even when you wasn't listening, God still called you. I wonder, do I have a witness? Now, is it perhaps the reason why in some circles there's so much strife? Could it be that the reason there's so much disharmony at the house and in the school, we know that's the problem with the government. But could it be that even at the house of God, that the problem is because this one command is being disobeyed by the people that love Jesus? And if you disobey the command, then you're not abiding in his love. And then if you are not abiding, then the fruit that would be born is, miss out, is missed out on. Could it be, and I search my soul, and I can go back and tell you the word of God is right. And I think back to so many, I won't call them disagreements around the house. We'll call them constructive arguments. We're going to put a sanctified twist on it. And I thought of how many conflicts I could have resolved if I would have only followed this command to take the initiative and then to love sacrificially without looking for anything in, in response if I would have done it unconditionally. If I would have followed this one command, I could have probably had more peace and harmony. Could have had more job opportunities instead of having to be walked out of the door. Yes, Pastor Greer was fired. Not from the last job I had. I let them go. But I can tell you, when I review my time I realized if I had uh, followed this command by Jesus there could have been peace and harmony where there was disharmony and strife that's what I don't want you to do I don't want you to miss out on God's blessing I don't want you to stumble in the same areas that I had I remember reading about a little boy outside of the bank. His mother had gone in to do something, but when he walked up, he slipped and fell. He's a little fellow, so he was close to the ground, didn't really hurt himself. He told his mother, I'm gonna wait for you out here. And I thought, what, what, what's up, what's up? But just to show you some of the love of God manifested. And just like him and his mother, others had come to the bank as well but everybody that came near where he fell he told them no no don't go over there under that snow is ice and this is where I fell and he just stood there till mother finished her business and came out and I thought what a picture of the love of God because when you love somebody you don't want them to stumble the same way you have and some of us could tell some younger people some of us could share what God have brought us through. If we wasn't worried about our reputation, we could tell somebody, stay away from her. Don't go that way. Stay away from the liquor store. Go home on Friday night. Oh, I wonder, do I have a witness? God will show you if you want to let him get the glory. See, the problem is we want the credit sometimes when God really deserves it. And so tonight I want you to know that if you take the initiative and act sacrificially, and if you do it unconditionally, Jesus says, if you do these things, 
then you will be abiding in my love. And if you do it, then your joy will remain. See, we are not so convinced that joy will follow obedience, but I want you to know if you are not a joyful person tonight, could it be that you have disobeyed the commands of Jesus? And if that's the case, I want, I've got some good news for you. It can be all fixed tonight. See, the minute you decide, you remember the 10 lepers, the Bible says they wanted to be healed, and Jesus didn't say they would be. Jesus said, I just want you to go and show yourself to the priests. And the Bible says, as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them turned around and said, I've got to go back and thank him now. And I want you to know when you step out in obedience to God's command. And I know some good wife might have a hard and a rough husband. But I'm telling you, if you love that man, take the initiative and love that man sacrificially and unconditionally. He will have to answer to God. When it's all said and done. You remember the woman, let me tell you about her. She told the doctor, I'm leaving that mean and evil man I married. I just want you to know I'm leaving him. And he said, well, listen, I got some advice for you. You want to make it really hard on him. Fix him the food you know he loves. For the next six weeks, act like he is God's gift to you. And he said, and then when you walk away from him, oh, he will mourn and grieve. He will never get over a good woman leaving him. And she agreed to do it. And by faith, she fixed him the good food without the poison in it. And she loved him and oh, she hugged him. She did it by faith. She was not staying with that man. She just obeyed the command to show that love to him. And a few weeks later, she came back to the doctors. And he wanted to know, did you let him go? Where is he now? And she said, I got to tell you something, doctor. And when I acted as you advised me by faith, my feelings for him changed. And that love changed him as well. And see, the answer all that time was in the love of God. If we would only obey, here is the secret. The secret to being a friend like Jesus is to take the initiative. It is to act sacrificially because the love that was shed for you and me, that was shared by Jesus, it was a sacrificial love. It cost him everything. He would give his all so that all of us would not be lost. And though, though Broad is the road that leads to destruction. No one in judgment will be able to say he didn't die for me. No one will be able to say there, there was not provision made. There was not redemption offered. There was not cleansing that I could have taken advantage of. No, no, there will be no voice in judgment that will say it was because I didn't hear about Jesus. No, no, the world will hear who Jesus is. And listen, my brothers and sisters, they need to hear it from you and me. And this, this is where I want you to go. Because to be a friend like Jesus is to love and to keep on loving. As we have a tendency to give up on folk. Uh, long before people separate 
somebody have decided I'm done. But I'm happy that wasn't true of Jesus. The Bible says he would love them to the end. And you and I, we're going to have to follow his example to bring glory and honor to his name. You don't have to agree with me, but the church in many respects has lost its influence. Almost nobody outside of a few members even listen to what we are saying. But that's not the disturbing part. Could it be that this is the case because we have been disobedient to the master? Now, I want you to search your own heart because as a Christian, you've got the power to love because he's going to supply it if you are willing to obey. Now, you don't have the power in yourself. See, this is what makes the Christian life that which is a paradox. We are weak and yet we are strong. We don't have no confidence in the flesh, but our confidence is in God. And the minute we decide to let him rule, and I don't have to tell you tonight that he's got the right to rule us. He is the one with the scepter in his hand. Jesus has the right to call the shots because he bought and paid for you and me, body, soul, and spirit. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. And you've been left to glorify and to honor him. Could it be that we are not loving as he loved us? Now that's going to hurt. That's going to hit you hard. But I want you to know Jesus can make it right. It's time. It's time for the church to wake up. We've fallen asleep. And if we can't love ourselves and one another, what are you taking to the world? We need to get this right within reach before we go out. We need to mend some fences. Some of us need to cross the aisle and say, I was sorry, I'm wrong. Please forgive me. I've said things, I've murmured, I've slandered. I've spoken things that were not true. And I need you, for Christ's sake, to forgive me. Now, that might seem like it's a difficult thing, but the minute you do it, and listen now, don't, 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 don't miss this. Because Jesus can change us. He is changing us and conforming us to his image. If we are willing to lay down our lives, for this is the love of God, 1 John 3, 16. For this is how we know the love of God, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for one another. And see, when the, church, when the world sees the church doing this, it's going to attract them. It's going to draw them in again. It's going to draw them in so that the gospel can be seen. Remember, Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples. Amen. If you have love one for another. And let me wrap the message up by saying what Paul already made clear, that without love, we are nothing. That sounds hard. That sounds harsh. He says, but without love, I don't care what you sound like. See, I don't care how gifted you are. Don't care how much faith you have. You could have enough faith to move all mountains. But if you don't have love, you are nothing. And I am nothing. Love conquers all. But it must be the love of Christ. Love is patient and love is kind. Love is not jealous and it's not rude. It don't act unseemingly. It don't cause a show. It don't want to show off. The love of Christ is for the benefit of others. 
And if you say you love Jesus, you ought to be seeking the highest good of another soul. Love never fails. It hopes, it believes. It will endure even difficulty. And I want you to know, I just come to remind you, this is the love Jesus has for us. If we would display this love, a love that rejoices in the truth and bears all things for Christ. Believing that God can change the worst of us. And I don't know about you, but I'm convinced that if the Lord can change me, you ain't going to be such a big problem. Amen. This is why I can keep coming back to the pulpit. Pastoring is not an easy task. But I've got a reason every week and every week to come back because of what the Lord have done for my soul. And I'm just one of these people that think if he could do it for me, surely you could have your life transformed because I can't see what you are really like, but I know what I was. the chief of the sinners I knew. But thank God he saves sinners. Say amen. I'm happy about that. How about you? Yes. Let me say that we need to be a friend like Jesus. I've told you what that involves. And let me tell you why. Because everybody needs Jesus as a friend. Yes, my brothers and sisters, you want to know why? Because of their past. Yes, oh, you can't do nothing to alter the past. But with Jesus, you can bring the past to the altar. Everybody needs a friend like Jesus because of the present. Oh, let me say, without the power of Christ, Satan would sift us as wheat. But if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passing away and behold, God can make everything new again. And you say, well, I don't know if she wants a new husband. Oh, yes, she does. And that job wants a new employee. And when Christ is real, listen, you ain't going to have to say nothing for a while. People going to be watching. I know they might know your past, but the change he brings. Listen, after a while, even sinners would agree. Something have happened to him. You go home and pour that liquor out and see what the wife say. Go home and get that black book out and burn it. Put it in the fireplace. Go home and get them funny cigarettes and that medical marijuana call and turn it over to Jesus and see what happens. See what happens. Your neighbors will be looking out the window when you leave the house. Somebody going to want to know what happened. Who did it? And when they want to know who did it, you can tell them it was Jesus. It was the Son of God. Lily of the valley, bright and morning star. His name is Jesus, and he's my everything. And I'm happy just to know that I'm his child. All you need is Jesus. And if you got him, that's all you need. And if you don't have him, he's what you need. Everybody needs a friend like Jesus because of the past, because of the present. And because of what's coming. Because I know you don't think all of what's happening in our world is some accident. Now I know you know time is winding up. You've got to know that we are living in the last and evil days. This is the Laodicean age. You've got to know Christ is soon to return. This ain't the time to play church. This is the time to be the church. This is the time.
to tell the truth. To love people in spite of what. And we better stop. Listen, listen. We've got to stop beating up on these homosexuals. They are not our enemy. They are the mission field. You want to know how they're going to be one? We're going to have to love them in. We're going to have to love them for Christ's sake. Not the sin. You could love the soul. I wish I had help. But everybody needs a friend like Jesus. Because Jesus is coming back. And though he will catch us up in the air, he will come to the earth again. And he will come to set up his kingdom. And he will return to judge the world in righteousness. And you and I will stand before him and give an answer to the things we have done in the body. And I don't know about you, but all I want to hear him say is, well done. You have been faithful over a few things. I used to wonder about that phrase, a few things, until you live as a Christian 30 years and you realize, it ain't even a few things. I will make you ruler over many. Enter now into the joy of the Lord. Be a friend like Jesus. Who is it that rubs you the wrong way? Who is the one that always gets on your nerves? Now look straight ahead. Don't look to the left or the right. You notice I ain't looking over there at Sister Grid. Just keep looking straight. You're going to be all right. Is it the boss? Is it the neighbor? Is it your spouse? Is it your child? Jesus gives us in this context a different approach. It's his approach. Jesus calls you and I to a new way to live. It's taking the initiative. It's acting sacrificially. It's loving unconditionally. Start loving others as Jesus loved you. Why? Because he says so. And the church said amen. I want to close with a story I just came across from a Baptist pastor in Houston at the West Memorial Baptist Church. They had gone to visit a professional who had come down with cancer, president of a large corporation. He had gotten cancer and it had ravaged his body. The company let him go he had gone through his insurance, used his life savings. He had almost nothing left. Pastor Ralph says that I went to visit him with one of the deacons and I said, Jack, your life is soon to be over. Have you prepared for life after death? And Jack stood up and was in a rage. He says, you blank, 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 blank Christians. He says, all y'all ever worry about what's going to happen after I'm gone. If your God was so great, why doesn't he do something about the real problems of my life? He went on to tell us that he was leaving his wife penniless. The job had gotten rid of him. The daughter with no money for college. And then he quickly ordered them out. And they left. But how many of y'all know, even if people reject the gospel, you must love them anyway? Amen. Well, the pastor followed his instructions. He wasn't going back, but the deacon called him and said, Pastor, I think we ought to go back and visit Jack again soon. He'll be gone. 
And they went back to him again. And between the time they had left and come back, Pastor Ralph says that when he got back this time, he said, I want to apologize um, that you were so offended by what happened last time, but we want you to know a few things. We found a realtor that's going to be able to sell your house and give the commission to your wife. Uh, one of the members at the church as a business owner, he's going to give your wife a job. And uh, we've got a fund that's going to help your daughter go to college, even though you're going to be gone. He said, we, we're gonna, there's some things we can do. And pastor says, that man broke down and cried like a baby. You all would do this for me. And though he never professed faith in Christ, and just a few days later, he was gone. But they had showed the love of Christ up to the very end. And though they didn't win him, they won the wife. Somebody say amen. We've got to get busy loving people. We've got to get busy loving as Jesus has loved us. This is your motivation. And remember, it is his command. And if you follow his command, then you are abiding in his love. And if you abide, then you can ask what you want, and it will be done unto you. Yes, my brothers and sisters, Manor family, Clearview family, the more you know about Jesus, the more you will love him. The more you love him, the more you will obey. The more you obey, the more you will abide. In abiding, you will bear fruit. And in bearing fruit, you will bring glory to the Father. So let's leave here and bear some fruit. Start at the house. Let me help you. If you can win the people in your family, that neighbor that keeps letting the dog go on your yard, he ain't going to be no problem. It's the people closest to you that sometimes can test you through the, to the limit. So start at the house, loving in spite of what you see and living a life of love and sacrifice. And see, let's just see what God will do in the days to come. We love you. You are in our prayers. I feel so in debt to this family. You have done so much for me, my wife, and my children. If you call us, and it's after 10 o'clock, I will pick up the phone because I owe. God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. Father, thank you again for the truth. Now bless this family, your people. Remember the youngest to the oldest, the weakest to the strongest, the one closest to you to the one that's further is away. Help them to know this night. Love covers a multitude of sins. And if we would love we would in fact fulfill the law for the law is comprehended in this one saying love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself to this end we pray now father spare us for this mission strengthen us to this assignment and may it be Lord that we would accomplish your will as we would love and live for Jesus. This is my prayer asked in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now listen. Are you here without Christ? Listen. It was for you that Jesus gave his all, was wounded and bruised, suffered so that you could be forgiven. If you're here and you're willing to confess that you believe Christ died to save you, 
raised for your forgiveness, then I want you to know this is the day of your salvation. Right now, the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, for with the heart man believes, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes will not be ashamed, and whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you're here and you need Jesus as Savior and Lord, I want you to pray this prayer. I want you to pray with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I want you to pray, Lord Jesus, I need you. I need you to save my soul. I am the sinner you died to rescue. I'm sorry for the life I've lived. I repent and I turn from my sin to you. Come, Jesus, rescue my soul. Save me from eternal damnation. I want to be a Christian in my heart. Take over in my life. Make me the person that you want me to be. Help me to live the rest of my life following you. Thank you for what you've done, Jesus. Thank you for hearing my prayer. For I ask in the name of Jesus for these mercies, I pray. And the believer said, Amen. Are you here? Would you confess? Pastor Greer, it's me. I want you to come. I want to pray for you. Won't you stand? Regardless of who you are and what you've done, you want to be a Christian in your heart. I want you to come. I want you to come. Who is it? I want you to stand. Would you all stand? Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor Greer, I'm visiting tonight. I'm a Christian, but I want to join Manor Bible. The door of the church is open. Would you come and confess with your mouth, I want to join. I love Jesus. I know him. Is there one? And the church said, Amen. Pastor Gaines, come.